Hey everybody, what's going on? Install Education back for another year. Uh, we're gonna start this year off right with uh, letting you save some money. So two of our favorite uh, people are the Core360 Belt and Human Locomotion, which is Dr. Thomas Shad. So don't forget, if you use the code Gestalt for the Core360 Belt, you get $5 off all belts, except for the ohm track sensors. So Brett, what about what, what are some of the Michaud's favorite, uh, some of your favorite Michaud uh, gadgets? Well, I mean, he's got a he's got a trunk full of gadgets, but I think my my favorite one definitely would be the we I mean, we use the Toe Pro quite a bit, mm -hmm. uh, the Toe Pro, and then I think the Varus and Valgus Post have really given people like a nice option if they're not want to take that leap into like a customized orthotic to kind of um, you know a good option for the patient, but also for, to let them kind of like you know bring the power back to the clinician to kind of decide where to post it. And so I, I think those are the two probably ones uh, of Tom's stuff that I love. And of course his tie, I can't get enough of his of his human locomotion. I mean the book is still to this day pure insanity. So. Beautiful. Yeah. Don't forget to use the code Gestalt on both those, the Core 360 belt, and then also Human Locomotion links are in all of our podcasts. And we hope you guys like today's episode. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Uh, Taylor here with Brett. Uh, we are here in, uh, well, where the hell are we first? So this isn't Cincinnati. Technically. We're, we're, we're across from the Cincinnati Red Stadium, basically in Newport, Kentucky. Newport, Kentucky. Thank you. Okay. Yes, and, the, uh, the port, we call the, it. Yeah, the, the port. So what a cool little town. And uh, I mean, we are so delighted, uh, Brett. I know you've been referencing this research for a really long time. Oh, yeah. I've been reading it recently uh, too with my, my kind of specialty in sports medicine, but uh, we are so excited to be sitting down with uh, Dr. Tim Hewitt. And uh, Tim, you've staked your name as literally the expert in the world when it comes to ACL, whether that is, uh, we're talking about reconstruction, we're talking about uh, pre-factors, we're talking about return to play, basically anything and everything you've kind of had your name stamped on, whether that's been in PubMed on the research or in the trenches in the, the clinical setting as well. And so so uh, one, we're, th we're thankful for all your research, but then uh, two, we're thankful to, to sit down with you, thankful for taking, taking the time. But let's maybe just start with um, anterior cruciate ligament. How did you get so infatuated with it, man? <laughs> it's, yes, uh, this this little guy was basically proportional to the size of the, the two first digits of your pinky. And I've spent decades <laughs> studying that, that. If you can, if you can imagine that. So the way I got out of this, I was actually in cardiovascular biophysics biomechanics, and I wanted to get back after college into sports medicine and sports. And I approached a, a group in Cincinnati here, and I said, "Hey, if I can make my way and write my own grants and basically build my own group, will you employ me?" And they said, "Sure, if you can do that, why not?" So I went with this group of surgeons. Frank Noyes was the was the lead, and worked with them for about a decade. And the first study that I was involved in with that group was a study up north of Cincinnati in Mason, Ohio, at a place called Soccer World. And the first idea was that AstroTurf, the old plastic AstroTurfs, had higher risk of, our surgeons thought, of ACL injury than natural grass. Well, it was kind of a perfect situation up at Soccer World because half the the fields were outdoor grass and half the fields were indoor the old the old plastic turf well it was kind of cool because in epidemiology it's it's difficult but still relatively easy to get the numerator of the equation how many injuries that you have the tough thing is the denominator what's the expo what's the actual exposure mm -hmm. and very few people can capture that data well we could capture that data at soccer world for multiple reasons first of all our athletic trainers staffed the facility so we had people on site to to not only get the numerator who's getting injured but at that time there was a co-ed soccer league there and you had to have at least half women. So pretty much then you'd have 50% women in every, 
in every game. And then the matches were played both indoor and outdoor. So about 50, 50 indoor outdoor games. So we, we had for, for an epidemiologic study, it was a perfect situation. We had both ATs there that could count the number of injuries, number of ACLs, but also count the background injuries and count the exact exposures because the games were exactly an hour long and the match was over. So we looked at this data, sifted through it and didn't see any difference between the old plastic turfs and grass. But when we started sorting through that data for other factors, we were one of the very first to show that a woman was 6.2 times more likely to tear her ACL than a man on the same surface, which was kind of mind blowing. And it, it was actually, we couldn't find any previous paper that showed that. Now we started digging back through the literature were and these non-traumatic or just the, all these, ACL these, tears? these are not these are non-contact non-contact yeah. these were non-contact ACL tears so when we looked back there was a in a relatively esoteric journal the journal of the Southern Orthopedic Association Terry Malone in the group he was at Duke at that time had looked at Big 10 and Pac 10 teams uh, men's and women's basketball and had shown a difference of 6.18 times almost exactly the exact same, same number. the exact same number and that's when you know you know when you have consilience of data like that with it coming together that's when you know you're on the right track that's that study propelled us into moving forward to figuring out, number one, why is this the case? Number two, what can we do about it? So we started a, a series of studies after that publication, which was in American Journal of Sports Medicine, that led us to five different studies. So this is the 50th year of AOSSM, which is American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, and that's the society of the journal that has AJSM, the American Journal of Sports Medicine. It's 50 years old as of this past summer. This led into five more AJSM publications that were all the most cited publication in that journal for that year. And that uh, what we did next is we said, okay, what our next publication was about is what differences in we measured various aspects of neuromotor control in volleyball, soccer and basketball players. And what we showed was basically women. And I think this can be generalized into any athlete who's at higher risk of an ACL has basically four neuromotor imbalances that lead them into greater risk. The, the first being athletes at greater risk are ligament dominant. And we can talk more about what that means. They're also quadriceps dominant, they're leg dominant, and they're trunk dominant. So we learned this and we learned these were potential factors, most importantly, modifiable factors that put an athlete at greater risk that that we published in 1996 in AJSM most cited paper of that year then we did a study which where we actually did a trial with intervention that directly targeted those four neuromuscular imbalances and we demonstrated in about 1300 athletes that we could reduce the risk of all ACL injuries by 50% and we could reduce the risk of non-contact ACL injuries by two thirds. Right. Published that in AJSM in 1999 and it actually uh, really struck a chord. That, that paper <laughs> was the first to demonstrate an effect like that. It actually about a year and a half later hit the front page of the New York times on September 11th, 2001, believe, oh, believe wow. that or not, that was on the front page yeah. of the New And as you imagine, as you can imagine, probably not a lot of people read that article. Right. Right. So from there, 
we progressed into so we we knew there were these neuromotor imbalances that put athletes at risk. We knew if we targeted these imbalances that we could reduce risk in the general population. So the next series of studies, which were all National Institutes of Health funded, were predicting which athletes are at risk. So we developed our drop vertical jump test, basically putting an athlete on a 30 centimeter, one foot high box, dropping off the box and rebounding a basketball at their max height. They had to do a true center line vertical jump and be able to pull that rebound down off a rebounder apparatus that we developed. And basically what we showed is those athletes that, again, were ligament dominance, quadricep dominance, leg dominant, trunk dominant, we could predict with, again, those four factors, a relative risk profile that was about 80% sensitive and specific. Wow. And from there, we've then moved forward into directly targeting these athletes picking those athletes out and then developing interventions directly for athletes that show these high risk profiles. And we've demonstrated in multiple randomized controlled trials that we can reduce the risk. Now, just south of here in Boone County, Kentucky, that's where the Cincinnati International Airport is and where my farm was at the time that we did these studies, we looked at all those kids in that county that played the sports of soccer, volleyball, and basketball and showed, again, we could reduce the risk of all ACL injuries by half, non-contact ACL injuries by two-thirds. Wow. So it, it's been a rewarding, uh, fun 20 years of work. Uh, it, you know, focus on this pinky size problem has been has been worthwhile and rewarding and i think and you know we can talk about where to go next and where the future is uh, but happy to answer any questions specific on that first series of studies we well have. you ha you know you talked about the the four areas of neuromuscular control what do you think about uh, soft tissue matrix, uh, maybe like structural hip antiversion, some of these things that are kind of thrown out there in your, in your, uh, history in this, how do those play a role? And I mean, we can, we'll also talk about other components of female hormones and stuff like that. But as far as have you noticed a trend in people that, you know, have high bait and scores or loose connective tissue throughout their body, are they more susceptible Yes, we, we in that series of studies, we looked at, at multiple potential factors. One of them, for example, is someone who has a lot of laxity, especially young females. We demonstrated that those that go into more than 8 to 10 degrees knee wrecker bottom, so they have a, a lot of that back knee movement, they're at significant. We, we did a a matched case control study on that and showed, yes, uh, someone with extreme knee laxity and record bottom is at greater risk. Now, could be associated, and this is actually very controversial, is this hormonal issue. It's pretty clear that one factor that does increase risk in a female is female the the menstrual cycle it's confusing though and the data is is uh equivocal it, it's it's not settled so the theory in the beginning and we we actually did a series of studies on on this as well and then have done several multi uh series analysis uh systematic reviews meta-analyses and they basically show that, well, the, the first idea is that through a woman's cycle, say on a 28-day normal cycle, day 14 to 16, when estrogen and then progesterone peak, if you look at laxity, say with uh, uh, 
Lockman test or or some more precise measure of anterior translation, say with a KT2000, what you can show is women's knees do get slightly looser. You can you they will you can anteriorly translate them slightly further. Now on average, that's only a millimeter, which is not more than a few hairs. Now, for someone like that, me, that may be significant. Right. But for from a clinical perspective, is that clinically significant? Maybe not. Now, we also did a series of studies and we did a series of meta-analyses looking at when the injuries actually clump together, when you see more injuries. Interestingly, that's just on the opposite end of the cycle. That's at day zero. That's at, at, at beginning of menstruation. So the knee gets more lax at day 14, 15. The injuries happen at the opposite end of the cycle around day zero. So what does that mean? There are many theories as to what that, for example, if you look at insurance industry data, women have more auto accidents around day zero. So it, it could just be a, a neuromechanical, neuropsychological issue, but there is some risk involved there. The problem with this, and, and we actually, when we published these papers, we took quite a beating. I mean, this was, this was in the late 90s, early 2000s, and that's not the most politically Wasn't correct. Wasn't a cool time to say? <laughs> hy- hypothesis to be ten, and, 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 it, and it continues today. I mean, e- even though that data is out there, when you bring it up, I mean, you, you better, if you're on the twit or something, you better get <laughs> you, ready you better to be, be ready. bashed. Because, uh, yeah, it, it's not popular, nor is it peaceful. <clears throat> there is some effect there. And... The other thing, and this gets even more controversial, is women on oral contraceptives, it appears, and there have been multiple randomized controlled trials on this, mostly out of out of Sweden and, and mostly women-led studies like uh, uh, Marguerite Moeller has, has done a series of studies, and she and her team basically demonstrated in fairly well-designed RCTs that women on oral contraceptives are, are at lower risk of ACLs. Right. Now, again, you talk about politically incorrect. Religious. There's all kinds of issues. And, yeah. and plus, you know, you, you get a coach involved and you tell them, number one, well, your athletes' knees may be slightly looser on in the middle of their cycle and they're – Injury risk may go up in the beginning of their cycle. Uh, what are they going to do? Sit their athletes out at this time? Obviously, probably a, not an acceptable idea. And then, you know, again, when you're talking about ACL injuries in girls and women peak around age 16. Right. So you're going to have, you're going to be handing out oral contraceptives to 14, 15, 16 year old girls, girls risk goes up. And this is another whole series of NIH funded studies that we did in Boone County, Kentucky. Now, the reason we went down there is because we had captured everywhere from sixth through 12th grade kids that were playing soccer, volleyball, and basketball. So we could actually follow these kids as they mature. Now, young boys and girls have no difference in relative ACL injury risk. It's a relatively rare. No, it's becoming more common as more and more kids flood into high demand sports earlier and earlier. However, relatively rare, relatively low incidence, below say 1%. And the there's no difference as far as we can tell between boys and girls. Once they hit that growth spurt at puberty, and I like to use a, a automobile analogy here. So the, the idea is boys and girls both start out with a small car. Let's say they both are driving a Prius and they both have that small Prius hybrid engine. What happens with puberty is both boys and girls. Now, this happens later in boys. 
in U.S. American girls, it's happening early and earlier. Actually, puberty starts on average around age 10 and a half, 11 in girls now. It's, it's inched forward over the last few decades. So boys, it doesn't happen until maybe two and a half years later, average age 12 to 13. But they both get a bigger chassis. So from a Prius, girls get, let's say, uh, a full-size Chevy Malibu, and boys get bigger than that, say a Cadillac. The difference is girls get a motor, a power surge, somewhere between a Prius and a Chevy Malibu size engine, slightly undersized. So this is this is easy to, to demonstrate. And we, we've done it, many others, in both cross-sectional studies and longitudinal studies. If you look at a simple power movement like a vertical jump, great, reliable measure, reproducible, valid measure of whole body power, girls basically stay the same. As they go through puberty, they don't jump higher. They jump the same amount, whereas boys jump significantly higher. So boys go go from a Prius to a Cadillac, but they get a supercharged Porsche engine. So boys are now you, you have in boys are more powerful, mainly due to that testosterone spurt, whereas girls are now underpowered for the size of their body, the size of their chassis. And that's what leads to these neuromotor imbalances we talk about of ligament dominance, leg dominance, quadriceps dominance, and trunk dominance, because they have to adapt to this undersized engine with movements that potentially put them at increased risk of an injury. Kind of the self-help guru, uh, Tony Robbins, he says, information without a purpose is useless. So do you know anyone in the world who is sitting their female athletes a couple times during the month when it might be advantageous to do so? Or is it, to your knowledge, is I mean, it's kind of like barroom trivia. We know that, but no one's actually utilizing there, it. There are people, especially in, in <clears throat> Scandinavia, I think Moeller and her group probably have used that data. Uh, they they tend to be the risk takers in in many ways in the medical field. The there are people though using that data, our data, and data of others to institute neuromotor training very early, right at the beginning of puberty, and it's demonstrated to make a difference. So in that Boone County cohort, we studied them for several years, looking at the identifying risk factors. But then what we did is randomized control trials where we targeted these kids with these risk profiles and demonstrated significant drops. Again, 50% to two thirds reduction in relative risk of all ACL injuries or of non-contact injuries. So we know that works. We know you can do that in, in developing young girls. Do you feel, I noticed you, you either use the term neuromuscular or motor control. Do you feel that it's important to distinguish between a motor control versus a strength issue? Like are those two things? Cause I think motor control almost like a timing issue and then strength is more of a, obviously a strength issue. We always train them together. Right. I, I think they go hand in hand. I think you want more strength, especially posterior chain strength. However, if you don't activate the stronger muscle, you're obviously not going to decrease your relative risk and right. your relative control. So I do think they, even though they're slightly different terms, yes, I, I think both are important yeah. and, and that ne they need to be trained together. You were really formative for me because I saw you, you probably don't remember this, years ago in Chicago with uh, Dr. Uh, McGill. Yes, yes, absolutely. So I first got exposed to your work there and then uh, also Christopher Powers' work. And at the time, both of you were telling a story of utilization of the muscles around the hip, that being glute max, glute, glute medius, glute minimus, basically all of these multipinnate muscles. Um, so... That's an obvious one. What do you think about the structure of the hip? Like, so if a female's got more antiversion in the hip, do you feel they're more susceptible to ACL tearing in your research? 
We haven't found that. So the 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 the, the most clear, easy clinical measure of that is Q angle. Sure. So when you're anaverted, you tend to have a, a, a greater Q angle. Women in general have slightly greater Q angle than males. The problem is a lot, especially surgeons tend to be very structural and they tend to be very bone oriented. So what what you'll hear very often is Q angle is the reason that women have more ACL injuries. In our studies, we measured Q angle and we did not see a relationship between Q angle and ACL injury risk. There have been two well-known, well, one well-known study, one lesser-known study, one in the lesser-known study in basketball players in Canada with greater Q angles showed greater risk of ACL injuries. And then there was a pretty well-known AJSM study in the mid-2000s by the group out of West Point comparing women cadets with male cadets and basically the military, especially where they pop a lot of ACLs is, is on the obstacle course. You know, you're dropping down off a 10 foot wall and, and women had a significantly greater risk of tearing their ACL and you whore check in that group looked at predictive factors and men, they, they only showed one predictive factor, which was increased anterior translation. And again, these were, these were more structural factors, whereas in women, they showed seven different factors. And one of them was more laxity, but the other one was greater Q angle. So those are the two big studies, but our data Oh, and at least there's at least 10 times the number of studies that show Q angle doesn't directly predict ACL injury risk. So that's still, is it a potential factor? Yes, in the extremes, uh, but it's not a good predictor straight on. So yes, the good news is anatomy doesn't dictate. It, it may play something of a role. It's not the biggest player. And the more modifiable factors are the bigger, more predictive factors. What do you think about it maybe being indirectly related in that maybe if somebody were to have hip antiversion, maybe the the thought is they struggle with using more like the posterior part of their glute medius or things like that. So maybe that correlation, maybe a loose correlation, but I, I would say the dynamic potential dynamic valgus that could lead them into is probably the more likely it it maybe underpins some of that more dynamic absence of neuromotor control right. that you observe okay so we talked to we've talked about the hip uh what contributions have you noticed at the foot and ankle ankle dorsiflexion eversion that are maybe leaving these athletes susceptible so th 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 these are hard to pick out, obviously, because foot type is really variable, shoe types. You've got all these confounders that you have to deal with. And we've done these studies in bare feet with, with any of the incoming shoes, with standardized shoes. And we've, we've not found any straightforward, simple relationship between, say, foot pronation and ACL injury risk. There, there was a study based out of Yukon using our drop vertical jump test that, that demonstrated that if you used a medial side wedge, that that would increase that dynamic knee abduction moment that we've shown to be a predictor, that dynamic valgus moment. Here's the thing. When you get it showed that it was protective against it showed, AC. Uh, not against injury, against a high knee abduction. Oh, okay. Moment. Yeah. So let, let's talk about the mechanism and how an ACL tears. So if if this is if this is my tibia and, and fibula and this is, uh, tibia and femur, this is tibia. This is the fibula, and basically this is the way an ACL tears. You get distally on the tibia. You get a distal tibial 
abduction moment, moving away from the midline. You get anterior translation, especially of the lateral compartment, internal rotation combined on very rapidly pops your ACL. So here's the deal. Anything you can do to decrease this, this, and this together is going to reduce your relative risk. But that is the mechanism. So so approaching decreasing that combination of movements is is first of all that together is predictive you'll see it in every single acl tear but also it's the target it's it's what we want to reduce so anything so the hip complex for example if you're using your glutes and your hip adductors, I'm sorry, abductors and external rotators, you're going to reduce your risk of an ACL injury. Right. And that's, and strength, both strength and activation are absolutely key. There was a, a paper that came out in 2020, actually from one of the Scandinavian countries, I forget which one, about the soleus actually playing a role as far as anterior tibial translation. What's your, what's your thoughts on that? Yes, I, I think the soleus is an important uh, contributor, the calf complex, the gastroc, depending on the angle, can actually be an agonist or an antagonist of the ACL. The soleus is a contributor and it's important, but the, we haven't figured out the, what, what we do know, for example, what we start out with is very simple in our, our plyometrics. One of the simplest plyometrics you can do is wall jumps. You just start with a slightly bent knee and just teaching them to activate, especially with a roll of the foot, to activate that musculature to as much as possible be a agonist of the ACL. I, uh, I had to do a knee talk recently and I was going through all your research and, uh, I found a paper where you guys were talking about like the tibial plateau, like the slope from a to P or P to a and like predictors there. Uh, does this matter? Is this something that you're not really looking at or just what would you say as far as it matters? So that was, that was one of the predictors in the military paper. And that's been shown by, by other groups as well. The question is, again, anatomically, what are you going to do about that? Are you going to x-ray to see it? Or, yeah. How are you going to find it? Find I mean, that? You're, you're not, I mean, you can actually surgically alter the tibial slope. And there are people who have had multiple ACLs that are, that are really high risk, that have a really high A to P drop off in their lateral tibial slope where... They'll actually do a, um, they'll, they'll take out a pie wedge shape of bone to do well, and then actually in decrease the slope. But that, that's, you know, extreme. <laughs> it's a rarity that a surgeon would actually take that kind of, that, that's someone that's going to, that's. It's going to have had already multiple ACL reconstructions and has a s extreme a anterior to posterior tibial slope and they again you create a wedge and then open that up and then put plates in and then you know put in bone matrix bone graft in there to to fill that in but but that is an extreme situation okay so you know over the last you know 20 30 years you've heard a lot about quadricep hamstring ratio in acl tearing so i think everyone would admit it's got to be somewhat of a factor in it but uh what's the voice of reason and all the noise between this uh this ratio between these two muscles it, it's a it's a great question it it depends how you measure it so it, what is the ratio? You know, someone says, well, what's the perfect ratio? Depends on the speed of movement. So at, at slower speeds, the hamstring quadricep ratio is higher. At higher speeds, it's lower because what you do is you introduce a, a more of a neural factor than a strength factor. You have to be able to kick out and pull your tibia back really rapidly, say if you're doing it 300 degrees per second or anything approximating when you do it to sport. We do in, in our, say our Boone County cohort, we found that as a factor, but it's not, 
a major factor. We do put that into our algorithms and we do definitely train the hamstrings. I mean, you posterior kinetic chain training is absolutely key. And that's, that's glute, that's entire hip complex. And it's absolutely the hammies because the hammies are what at relatively, well, all knee angles, but especially at relatively extended knee angles, bring that tibia back while the quadriceps is pulling it forward. One of my, uh, one of my buddies, he played football at Georgia, and uh, he was there when Garrison Hurst was there. Yeah. And he tore his ACL, and just at that time, the ACL wasn't quite the home run, the repair as it is now. So he said he did three hours of hamstring rehab every single day in an attempt to not have to do the surgery, and, and actually kind of was able to, to pull it off. You, you want to, uh, again, it's key up in that hamstring strength, but more key up to ba- up upping hamstring along with glute and and hip activation. Right. So there's also some evidence to show, and I think actually you've talked about it before. The flexibility in the muscles in the lower extremity can also. So we've talked about strength a lot. Uh, what if you have you know if you have a straight leg raise of let's say 60 degrees? So you have limitation there. Are you at more risk for an ACL tear because you have poor flexibility in the muscles in the lower extremity? It depends, and and there's a there's a lot of conflicting data here. Some would say. The looser the hamstrings are, the the greater risk you are because there's going to be electromechanical delay between when you take the slack out of those hamstrings and when they actually start contracting. So a lot of people will say, well, young females are already relatively lax relative to, to males. You certainly don't want to be stretching their hamstrings out like mad when you want that hamstring to turn on as rapidly as possible. So that we don't have really good data. We know the hamstrings are absolutely crucial, but the, the slack in the hamstrings electromechanical system, we don't know for sure whether that plays a role though. Theoretically it could, especially in young females with really lax hamstrings. Okay. And I think now one of the more understated mechanisms for ACL tearing is center of gravity being outside of base of support and landing. So I've always looked at like the anterior component of it, but then um, looking at your work, you talk more about the 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 coronal plane. plane. Yeah. Coronal plane. It's, it's absolutely crucial because you, you remember what, what tears the ACL comes from the foot. It's the ground reaction force. And when, so when your foot hits the ground, so you've got this force vector coming from your foot. So almost every ACL you'll see is lands on a flat foot. What that means is it's a high ground reaction force. So you're not rolling the foot, dissipating that force. You're landing flat high ground reaction force. The ground reaction force is here to your center of mass near your umbilicus. What happens when the trunk is out of control, and this is the essence of trunk dominance, when there's too much both frontal and sagittal plane motion of the trunk, but especially frontal or coronal plane motion, that ground re- that center of mass moves over and when that center of mass goes lateral to the center of the hip and the center of the knee joint what you get is a ground reaction force from your foot that's lateral and adducts your hip and ad abducts your distal tibia collapses your hip and knee inwards that almost certainly plays a role in nearly every ACL injury. So control of the positioning of the center of mass relative to the base of foot support is absolutely key. So one of the keys, don't land with a flat foot. Roll your foot from midfoot, heel back rocker. That dissipates force a lot. And controlling the trunk to the level where the center of mass 
doesn't go lateral to the hip joint center and knee joint center. And I think too, I mean, like people who haven't been in this world, like it's so easy to just hear what we were talking about right now and say, well, this just means they need more core strengthening, you know? So how much of this is actually training the abdominal wall versus like, you just need to learn how to, when you land from a jump, keep your center of mass within your base of support or, you know? Yeah. And so again, yes. And I, th that's where we start out is basic core control core contraction, core control, but then you have to make it foot-based. Uh, again, doing repeated plyometrics, starting out two feet, going to a single foot, then progressing back to athletic movements on two feet where you're controlling that center mass position over the plantar surface of the foot without it going especially too far lateral or medial or anterior, posterior. It, it's it's the answer is both better overall control of the core musculature, but then progressing that to con exquisite control of the core with the plantar surface of the foot, preferably up on the ball of the foot and not outside and lateral to the hip and knee joint centers. And you hear, as far as mechanism, you hear, um, dwell time, you hear deceleration injury, you hear immunization, you, everybody uses different terms, but how much of that is a component in ACL tearing, do you think? It's absolutely important. It, again, the foot not flat, so you don't have a ground high ground reaction force, and that's what we're doing with plyometrics, is we're decreasing that amortization phase and teaching the athlete to control that center of mass with a stable foot base decelerate rapidly and re-accelerate using the musculature, especially the big muscles of the body, the, the biggest muscles in the body, the glute hip complex to, to reduce and dissipate those ground reaction forces before they hit the knee joint. Okay, team, what have we missed as far as, so we, we've talked about foot and ankle contribution. We talked, I, I just have one uh, one question along those lines. If I hear you right, it seems like in our training as far as prevention, it may be more important to train closed chain than an open chain. Do you still find open chain training to the quadriceps and hamstrings an important role, or is it more important to train them closed chain? Or both. Or, or both, or yeah, where's that? I, I'd say both. And I, I do think, yes, I think closed chain training is absolutely important because you have to have that foot base. It, it has to work the way you're going to take it out onto the field and, and the court. However, in preparation, I mean, if you, if you want to isolate the musculature, the way to do it is open chain. So, you know, again, it's probably a progression where you start out more open chain and then you move to more closed chain. And I know you're familiar with the paper that I'm going to cite right now, but there's uh, in the running research, you see they took a group of runners and I think it was a six week uh, strengthening program for the glutes, basically, or the external rotators and abductors, the hip. And they looked on a treadmill and they saw knee valgosity. These athletes, they all got 50% stronger in the strengthening program. They go back to the treadmill, nothing changed changed at all as far as like the motion capture that they were seeing in the position of the knee so and i mean i think those of us who've been in it we we realize that but uh so it sounds like too like uh for for jumping one of the real important components is for the athlete to have the imagery and the feeling in their own body besides strengthening their hips and everything we're talking about they also got to know yes yeah. and that and that has to do with feedback that that has you know so you you have to have multiple levels of feedback in your training, whether that's a mirror, whether it's a video, whether it's verbal, you, you have to square up the hip and the knee during, during high level jump training, repetitive plyometrics. Right. What about uh, like the, the kind of the new in vogue thing is like power plates and uh, force plates to kind of measure is that are you playing think, with that? Think, our, yeah, sure. Yeah. We use force plates all the time. It it's uh, definitely a useful adjunct. It is it is worthwhile using force plates to monitor those forces. Again, you can show uh, off a simple drop vertical jump test if you just cue someone to land softer. It decrease it. You can reduce by a body weight their landing force. 
which mainly what they're doing is rolling their foot more and flexing their hip and knee more, which is absorbing load better. All all good things. What about the idea of our athletes are going to be in these weird situations, depending on where the ball is, where all those types of things are. Would we ever consider training them into Valgassi, training them into different positions? Absolutely. What you want to do is I, I think of it by, I think of it as an envelope of neuromotor control and you want to just keep edging that envelope of neuromuscular control out wider and wider and wider Mm -hmm. under chaotic circumstances. Absolutely. Incorporate that into your training. Do you, you know who Gary Gray is? Oh, I know. Yeah. So we've, we've become pretty tired than he was recently on our podcast and we were, you know, the ongoing debate of like joint centration, you know, we want our joints in a good position. And he, I mean, he's been saying what I'm about to say for 30 years, which is, yeah, but if you're running this way and you now got to run this way, whether you want it to be there or not, this, you know, that knee is going to get itself into some Valgasi. So the debate is, you know, how much do you control in that range? How much will you allow? What, you know, when uh, foot position, hip recruitment, there's so many variables, increase posterior chain contribution, roll the foot more, and then your your knee can, and flex your knee more and your knee can handle those situations right uh bmi is there any correlation with acl tearing and oh uh, uh, always yeah. so so bmi is is in every one of our predictive algorithms so uh, the bigger you are the the higher the force is going to be mm-hmm. i mean that's that's simple physics so yes um one way to reduce relative risk is to reduce BMI. I know right. a lot of people don't want to hear that, but yeah, it's one of the reasons that uh, pro football players are at such high risk. I mean, they're big, muscular, high BMI people. They're, so their loads are very high. Right. So, Dr. Hewitt, if you just went to the local high school right now, let's say you just dropped into anywhere in, in the country right now and you had to build, let's say, an eight week ACL prevention program, like wh- where would you put on the spectrum? How would you build that? What would that kind of look like? I know I'm kind of forcing you to put your hand out there a little bit, but what, what would that all entail and what would it look Again, like? Again, it, it's basically relatively simple. It, it's going to be anything we can do to decrease this and decrease the ground reaction force and decrease the neuromotor imbalances. I talked about ligament dominance, leg dominance, quadriceps dominance, and trunk dominance. Any way we can reduce those things. So low level, start with low level, double leg plyometrics. Do anything you can do to increase posterior chain i like i really like russian hamstring curls i think that's a great adjunct exercise to the plyometrics a lot of single leg dynamic balancing work and strengthening of the hammy uh, glute complex but in a way that really pushes increased activation of posterior chain. We said we weren't getting ahead of ourselves here. I know. No. Sorry. That's right. So um, one more thing on the assessment. So can it be as simple as watching someone drop down from a plyometric box with video? I mean, it, do you think like that's a really good, cause you know, the, the whole adage in sports medicine is the only predictor of future injury is, you know, previous injury. So, if you have one test, if you let's use Taylor's example, you go to a high school and you can do one thing. I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna do a drop vertical jump test, take a video capture, and look and see how much dynamic valgus there is on that. And I'd say a simple rule would be, you look at right before they land the distance between their knee joint centers, and then you look at the maximum amount of collapse. And I'd say if that's more than 50% of the down below 50% of the distance of the knees prior to them hitting, that athlete's at relatively high risk, clearly demonstrates ligament dominance and work with that targeted into your, that targeted knowledge into your progressions. I, have we missed anything on like our, the, how big is the problem in the assessment? Because we can shut this one down and then start the next one with the, you guys have grilled me up pretty good. Yeah, sorry yes. about that. No, no worries. My, it's my pleasure. My yeah. absolute pleasure. No, I think it was perfect. I think we, we covered everything that we needed to. I mean, uh, 
we know it's a problem. We know some of the predictors now. And so we're going to stop this first episode and we're going to take a little break and regroup. And then we're going to come back on the other side and we're going to, I already got ahead of myself, talk about how the hell we prevent it. When you do get an ACL rupture, what do we do? What are return to play criteria and all those types of things? So in the news world, we call that a teaser. That was a perfect teaser for where we're going. Yeah. All right, guys, stay tuned for round two. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Gasol Education Show. Uh, if you liked it, share it, subscribe to it, uh, send it to your friends, send it to someone that needs to hear this message. Uh, we really want everyone to be able to, to tune in and, and get the, the best clinical advice that they can, which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations, let us know. Uh, for a list of our upcoming courses, we're adding them all the dang time. So go to gestaltedu.com, click on courses, and they'll all be right there for you. All right, have a good day.